So I'm very aware that I'm talking to people online and in person. So if I'm acting weird, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, my name is Courtney Masterson. I am an ecologist. I'm gonna tell you what that means. Um, and I own and operate Native Lands, which is in the middle of transforming into a nonprofit organization. But we are a, uh, an ecological restoration and community education organization. That means that when we do native plantings, we invite the community to join us and we teach them about why we're doing it and what we're doing and how to do it at home. Um, it's very rewarding work. I get to work with a lot of families, um, all age groups, lots of interest groups. I'm a very lucky person. Um, and I'm glad to share a talk with you today. I do a lot of talks at the Lawrence Public Library. We're based out of Lawrence, um, but I've never spoken here before. I'm very excited about it. Um, so this is kind of what my day-to-day -day looks like. Sometimes I'm out in a prairie. Uh, sometimes I'm planting gardens in urban settings in cities um, for businesses. Sometimes I'm teaching botany. Does anybody know what botany is? It is something to do with plants. It's one of those many, many words scientists use to describe themselves, right? Um, it means I study plants. Yep, I study plants for a living. Um, and I'm an ecologist. And what an ecologist is, is someone who studies the ways living organisms, living things like plants, animals, funguses, little, little bugs that live in the soil, monarch butterflies, how they interact with their environment. Um, and so my research was actually on how white-tailed deer, our local deer, affect tall grass prairie plants. So I spent a lot, and I still spend a lot of time in observation of how deer interact with the prairie. It's really cool. So that picture on the right is um, a picture of me emulating a deer in one of my study plots. So I actually used a deer skull to chew plants. It was really interesting. Um, I thought it was really cool. Um, not everybody's into deer skulls, I get it, but I enjoy it. Um, this is where I get to work. I get to work outside in wildflowers all the time. I'm going to introduce you to some of the wildflowers that I get to work with every day um, if you're here in person. If not, check out the Baser Community Library garden. There's some really cool native plants in that garden. We got to give it a little tour before I came inside today. So Kansas is home to mostly prairie. Um, even in this part of the state, the northeast corner of the state, about 90% of the historic cover of the land was grassland. And that's not what it looks like now. When we step outside of the library and we look around, we're lucky here in Baser, there's actually still a, a decent amount of grassland here. But think about driving into Kansas City or into Lawrence um, or into Johnson County. Most of that grassland is gone. Um, and uh, the grassland, the prairie in Kansas, is why uh, Kansas is home to it's such a great diversity of plants. So the word biodiversity just means lots of different living species. So we uh, in Kansas are home to over 2,000 different species of plants. I have, I think, 10 here. So imagine what 2,000 would look like. And then mix them together and create an expansive grassland. It's hard to imagine how much it would have covered. It was hundreds and hundreds of thousands of acres of prairie. Um, and they can look very different. So this is Western Kansas, if you can believe it. Look how hilly and beautiful and rocky that is. Uh, prairie, short grass prairie in Western Kansas. And then this is uh, Lyon County, Kansas, which is sort of central Kansas. Um, and as you head closer to us, it gets a little taller, a little wetter but really beautiful, really showy. Um, there are other ecosystems in Kansas though. What's an ecosystem? Um, for those of us who may not know what that word means, an ecosystem is, uh, is a well-defined space that's defined by its plants, its animals, um, it, like birds and butterflies, even the snakes and turtles that use that space. Um, will be different in a wet space, a shady space, right, than when you would be in a grassland. Um, we have four, to make it very simple, there's lots of different types of prairies and forests, but four types of ecosystem in Kansas. Prairie, deciduous forest, which means the leaves fall off of the trees. That's the fancy word deciduous means. Um, 
and the ecotone between the grass and the forest, which just means the edge and wetlands, lots of different types of wetlands. Um, my research mostly occurred here in the fancy prairie and forest ecotone area because that's where deer like to live. So because I spent a lot of time studying prairies, the edge of the forest, and then inside of the forest, I got to meet a lot of plants. Um, and I've spent my postgraduate school time studying a lot of wetland stuff. So I've gotten to spend a lot of time in, in Kansas's various ecosystems. And what I've learned is that knowing the plants and understanding how the animals interact with the plants um, helps me understand the greater ecosystem because the plants are the food that provides resources to everything above it, everything more complex. Even when we're talking about the things that live in the soil, those things wouldn't be there without the plants either. So the plants are integral to uh, the survival of the rest of the ecosystem. So I'm, I'm lucky that the, the subject I'm so passionate about happens to be something that connects to everyone else's interests, whether it be what you're eating, uh, the animals that pollinate your food, the animals that might eat your food crops like deer, um, <laughs> understanding caterpillars. Um, certainly folks who grow food that don't understand caterpillars might feel frustrated at caterpillars, right? Um, but I get to spend time with really cool things like frogs and, and butterflies. Um, so native plants uh, provide just about every kind of resource you can think of. And sometimes we forget that native plants were food, were medicine, were fiber, were shelter, um, filtered the water, um, took care of our soil. And that's what was going on for, and still is, um, arguably, what that was what was going on for uh, the prairie is about 15 to 20,000 years old. It's a long time, but it's actually a really young ecosystem <laughs> in relation to other ones. But for 20,000 years, the prairie did all of these things. And I know there's some big words on this screen, um, but you kind of get the idea. Um, let me show you. So this will be my challenge to you here in a second, but I wanna show you um, all the different ways that prairies function. Um, their deep roots, there's gonna be an image here in a minute that shows you the depth of the roots. Their deep roots anchor the soil. Uh, the above ground growth, everything above the soil feeds the wildlife, um, provides us food. Um, for 20,000 years, the prairie plants have provided us medicine and our own food. Um, I often weave or create textiles, art, um, fabrics were made from the plants of the prairie. Um, it's sort of limitless. Everything that you think about using inside of your house would have been in the prairie. It, would have, it was everything for the folks who lived in the prairies up until really about 100, 150 years ago, 200 years ago. Um, even the earliest European settlers would not have been able to make it without using the prairie um, as a resource. Um, the prairie is completely dependent on disturbance. What does disturbance mean? That's a word, one of those words that's hard to, to define. If I was to disturb something, say I was disturbing soil. What are ways we might disturb soil? Dig it up, absolutely. So tilling, digging, all the other things, rutting around in it like a bison would, making a wallow. Um, we also disturb prairies with fire. Has anybody seen prairie fires in person or on TV? I bet we've all sort of seen them somewhere, pictures of them. Here's a picture right there. So now you've seen it. Um, <laughs> we hay prairies um, and we do that for a lot of reasons. Sometimes we can't burn, but also prairie hay is really nutritious and good for our horses and our cows and our goats and all the other animals that like to eat grass. Um, but the Tall grass prairie used to expand from about central Canada all the way down to, I mean, technically Mexico um, and, and quite broad. So 170 million acres. That's really hard to picture in your head. The largest prairies that are left um, are in Oklahoma and Kansas. Uh, the tall grass prairie preserve and Kanza are our largest prairies in the state. Really cool. But um, even standing in those spaces, you can't quite get, please feel free to come in. Um, 
you can't quite get the feel of what it would have been like to stand in a sea of grass that expanded as far as the eye can see. And there wouldn't have been any trees except down really low or around water. So that's one of the things I really like to talk to, especially my young friends that come out into the prairie with me. If you stand in your backyard and turn around in a circle and think about that all would have been prairie, think about all the trees that you see and all the woody plants that you see. Those are there because we planted them, which is really interesting. Um, and because we stopped burning and fire helps keep trees out of prairie. So I do a lot of burning. Ryan and my partner here um, and I, uh, that's what we do all winter is burn prairies. Um, and a lot of that is to try to keep it functioning, keep it diverse and to keep prairie there. Um, so here's kind of a rough, kind of a cartoony map, but it's a nice one of, of what the expanse of prairie in our area would have looked like. And this is specifically tall grass prairie. The entire state of Kansas was prairie. It was just a different kind of prairie. Um, only 4% or really less in the counties right here in Northeastern Kansas, it's less than 1% of our prairie is left. 4% uh, across the entire original extent of the tall grass prairie is left. Mostly those Flint Hill spaces I was talking about. Um, this, so in Shawnee County where Topeka is, 90% of that county was prairie. The same would have been true here. And in Douglas County where I did a lot of my research, we have very little prairie left. So let me show you. I know it gets real sciencey. I'm gonna try not to be too deep, but I like these maps. Um, an organization in Douglas County called the Kansas Biological Survey um, worked from notes from land surveyors back when the, in the very earliest days of European settlement. So books, imagine your journal or your notebook, your spiral notebook from school. You were writing down every time you saw a tree, when you were walking you know, north, south, you would walk and walk and walk and write down landmarks. There was water here. There was a tree here. That's how rare trees were. There were trees here. <laughs> I, they didn't write a lot about where grass was because everything was grass, um, but certainly they described the grass. And so they used all these journals to create this map. And it shows us where the prairie was and where the forest was, which is really interesting. So where the red, red hash mark is, Notice how the red hash marks are around the water. So this is the Kansas River here. Everybody know where the Kansas River is? Yeah, okay, good. I've actually meet people regularly, dozens of times a year who have never seen the Kansas River. It's really sad. Um, the Wakarusa River, it's right here. Does anybody know what that blue blob is? It's a funny shape. What do we think? It's Clinton, yeah, it's Clinton Reservoir. So we created Clinton Reservoir by damming up the Wakarusa River. So this used to flow, see where this red hash mark is? That's not because there were trees in the water. That's because the Wakarusa River used to run this way. So notice that the trees were only where the water is. There's some really cool historic forests in Baldwin City. That's where this is down here um, because the ground, the water table was so high up, water would stand here. So wetland spaces is where you'd see these other red spaces. Everything else that's not red hash mark would have been prairie. The neon green is where forest is now. And certainly this doesn't capture all of the forest, but it gives you an idea of how much more forest there is than there used to be. So this is what's left of prairie and high quality forest in Douglas County. And all of the counties in Northeastern Kansas would look like this. So this yellow color is what's left of our prairies. This dark green color is what's left of the historic forests. And everything else is a new forest that's so new, we don't even have a name for it. We really don't. I was just talking to the Kansas Forest Service about this the other day. What do we call these new forests? And there's no name yet. We're trying to figure it out. Um, these old growth forests in Baldwin City, um, this is kind of... Um, a uh, hard part of just Dennis County describes, there's not a big city over there. Um, but there's, these are old wet spaces where really nice oak forests are, oak and hickory forests, where you go to find pawpaws. You guys know about pawpaws? You would go, if you were looking for pawpaws, you would go to these places. The new forests that we can't describe yet don't have pawpaws unless we plant them. And we do a lot of pawpaw planting. Um, but so this is kind of, this is the story that drives me to work on prairies every day is that, this is what we're trying to protect. This is what's left of, of what used to be 
this whole county would have been yellow, um, full of prairie. So uh, some of our really nice remnants are protected by um, some of the cool organizations that um, I've, I've prepared some documents and shared them on the table there. I think uh, organizations like Grassland Heritage Foundation, Kansas Land Trust, um, even um, the work of Monarch Watch and several of the other nonprofits that do education all directly impact um, the, the protection of tall grass prairie in this part of the state. Uh, when we lose prairie, we lose all of those things that it used to provide. Um, and, and maybe the most important part of that for those of us who can go to the grocery store and buy food are things like water quality or soil health. So when we don't have prairie to anchor our soil, our water quality goes down and we lose the soil that helps us grow food. I was just at, what is that, Brothers Market? <laughs> Killing a few minutes and looking at the corn, the fresh sweet corn. That's, this is like my favorite season. I love sweet corn. We wouldn't have that sweet corn if we didn't have the healthy soils that the prairie provided us. Um, it's very important that we can protect our soil. And this is um, a nice graphic that talks some more about the what are called ecosystem services, but some people even don't like that term because it implies that the the prairie provides those things for us, whereas it's really providing it um, to the entire ecosystem, right? Um, but this is just some of the things that, um, that we thought up to throw on this map. What are some other things that you think ecosystems provide us? I'm sure I've missed some things, and these are some really fancy words. What about some of my young friends in the audience? What do we think? What else do you think an ecosystem provides to us? I talked about soil, I talked about water. What else? Anybody can share, yeah. Hard work. Hard work, <laughs> they are. Actually, I think that's really important to talk about. It is hard work. Uh, we work a lot to protect these spaces and you can't just leave them be. If you don't take care of your ecosystems, um, they don't function the way that they would have historically. And that's because we've put them in such little boxes, right? If you used to be this much space plus every other county in the whole state, and now you're just this tiny little spot, it's really hard to act the way that you did before. Um, good point. What else? That was a good idea. Hmm. I can talk about some of the examples up here. Um, I like that it includes things like scenic beauty because um, some of my favorite times have been outside. Certainly, I get to work outside, but I also get to play outside. And we don't think about it, but you know, watching a butterfly in your garden, that is a service it provided you. The way you feel when you watch the monarchs uh, fly around on the zinnias outside, um, that's a really special feeling that you wouldn't have if you just stayed inside all day, certainly. Um, so here is that graphic I was talking about. Um, that, that shows the depth of prairie roots. And this is hard to understand, so I'm gonna interpret it for you. This is lawn grass. And it's so small, you can't even see it. They really have a depth of just a few inches, which is a very troubling few inches if you're trying to manage crabgrass or something. Those few inches are really annoying, but they're just a few inches. Um, whereas when you step over to, let's say, so this plant here, lead plant, is in that seed blend back there. Lead plant has a 15 foot root system. If you can't picture 15 feet, imagine me on top of me on top of me, three Courtney's deep. That's very deep. Why do they have such deep root systems? What do you guys think? Why would you need deep roots like that? Water. Get to water, extremely drought tolerant. Absolutely. So in years like this, gosh, it's dry. I'm dry just thinking about how dry it is outside. I need a drink of water. Um, in years like this, lead plant doesn't care. All of our lead plant in our gardens is super happy. It bloomed, it looks wonderful, no effect of the drought. And not only is it happy reaching that groundwater 15 feet deep, but it's also providing all of its resources to the wildlife that depend on it, even though it's so droughty. So there's still food for the animals that eat lead plant. Um, it still provided flowers for the pollinators. Um, really important. And this is just, a, like I said, a small sampling of the 2000 species that live here that do that work for us. Some of the other examples they give you on this graphic are um, 
this is a blazing star. I have a blazing star to share with you today. Um, this is big blue stem. We kind of love big blue stem, really iconic Kansas prairie grass. Um, and it shows about 10 feet deep. The other thing that we don't think about with prairies, we often don't compare prairie to like the rainforest. And I know when I was in school, I learned a lot about rainforest, <laughs> which is ironic. Um, but uh, the tall grass prairie is actually sequestering carbon or storing carbon the way that a rainforest would. And the way that they do that is they grow new roots every year. So even though they have a 10 foot or a 15 foot root system, they grow more roots to replace those roots every year and they leave those dead roots in the ground. And it provides nutrients in the soil. It keeps that soil anchored. And every time that plant grows new roots, it's pulling more carbon down into the soil. So the prairie is functioning very much the way that a rainforest would. And, 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 and when we tear up prairie, we lose that carbon, we release it back into the earth, just like we, or into the atmosphere, just like you do when you clear cut a rainforest. So similarly, um, tough, to, tough to absorb. Um, I'm gonna talk now about what we do about providing some of the resources that we've lost when we lost prairie. Um, so specifically talking about gardening for pollinators and birds and other wildlife. And if you at least tune in on Zoom, but if you can come in person, do come when Wayne gives his talk in a couple of weeks. Wayne, say hi. Hi, Wayne. Um, he's going to speak specifically about monarch gardening and taking care of monarchs and why we care about monarchs. And that's a really important theme at the library right now. It's very cool. Um, so monarchs, believe it or not, are not pollinators. Did you know that? Most butterflies are not pollinators. What does that mean? Um, we always lump butterflies in with pollinators. That means that when a butterfly comes to a plant, it's not after pollen. It's not moving pollen on purpose. Sometimes it gets stuck on a butterfly. It's there for the nectar. It's just there to get a drink and leave. Whereas when a bee or a beetle or a wasp, a lot of pollinators visit a flower, they are after that pollen. They also use the nectar but they want that pollen. And when they move from plant to plant, they're moving pollen. Um, pollinators, I, um, sorry, butterflies. I think I have the right vocab word, but someone is gonna be screaming in their minds at me. I think they're called incidental pollinators, which implies that they are a pollinator, but really they're not. It means that if there is pollen stuck to them, it was by accident. They're not after the pollen, um, but I love butterflies. Uh, and they do a lot of important work in our gardens and they're important food. I know that's hard to think about, <laughs> but butterflies are really important food for the rest of the ecosystem. Um, so pollinator food is nectar and pollen. What's nectar? We could probably guess, but it's kind of like, what do you think? What does it taste like? Sweet, yeah. So sweet, so I always say it's kind of like Kool-Aid. <laughs> it's sugar water, basically. There's a little bit more to it, but it's mostly sugar water. And it's the fuel that the animals using the nectar need to go from place to place. So it's like Gatorade, kind of. Um, pollen is mostly protein. It's really heavy protein. So it's like a Gatorade and a peanut butter sandwich. You need both of those things. Um, but you may be after one thing or the other, specifically when you visit a plant. And different animals use different ratios of those things. Some, some of them are more interested in the pollen, some are more interested in nectar like a butterfly. Um, but either way, these plants are producing those two substances so a little bit for themselves, but also to attract the uh, animals to the plant with rewards, okay? Um, when you're trying to provide some of the resources we've lost when we lose prairie, you're you're working in a totally different space than people would have been 200 years ago. Um, however, you're using the same palette of plants. So if you're trying to provide to the ecosystem what the prairie was providing, you're using native plants. Um, these are just some of the examples of places we've done gardens. Um, this is uh, Oak Hill Cemetery, great place to do native plantings. If you have a cemetery that you'd help take care of. Um, city, city parks, certainly, and at home. Um, and they, they can be just as beautiful as any other uh, garden that you would install, but you would notice a lot more interaction with wildlife. Um, but when you design a space like that, you wanna think, I think anyway, yeah, to avoid your, the most frustrating situations. First think, 
like an ecologist. Think like someone who studies plant animal interactions and ecosystems, right? Think about what you're trying to create and then think like an artist. A lot of gardeners go in like an artist first, which is really cool. And some people are amazing plant artists. Um, but sometimes that leads to frustrating situations. And I wanna talk about some of those today. So an ecologist would think about how big is this plant going to get? Do I wanna put this in my yard or at the cemetery where folks are trying to um, have a nice visit? Or you know, how much is this going to spread? Will it spread? Do I want it to spread? How much sun is available to me? What's the soil like? Um, when does it bloom? If you're gardening for wildlife, you want blooms all the time, not just at one time of year. Um, is it perennial? What does perennial mean? Uh -huh. Yes, so perennial is opposite of an annual is what our, our friend in the audience is saying. Annual means it lives for one year. Perennial, there's a lot of different kinds of perennials, but perennial means it can live for more than one year. Sometimes short-lived perennials live two or three years, like biennials, um, or they can live for a really long time. Compass plant can live for decades. So that's a really cool plant, uh, prairie plant. Um, and what else are we trying to provide to our ecosystem, which is maybe your backyard or the bank, right? <laughs> we just did a bank planting or, or the church. We work with a lot of churches. Um, what other organisms, what other living things are we trying to provide resources for? So you plant a few different th things a little bit differently for birds than you would for butterflies or for bees or frogs. What are you planting for? Um, set your goals. Um, my goals are to try to be as close to prairie as possible without making anybody upset. <laughs> and so I'm always looking for drought tolerance. I don't want to water these places. We often plant in places we may never go back to, which sounds crazy, but when you're that busy, you just don't get to go back. Uh, low maintenance, meaning I don't have to touch it a lot. Um, what, what organism am I providing for? I'm obviously, because of what I do for a living, I'm providing for everybody. So I'm trying to think really broad. And often I'm providing resources for people too. So can it be medicine? Can it be food? We do tea gardens. We do um, sensory gardens, especially for young folks, You know, things you can touch and taste and smell and feel. Um, Set those goals before you go buy plants. Otherwise, you're going to have to figure out how to make the plants you bought fit your goal. And that's tough. Bird gardens are one of my favorite things to plant. And uh, there's some really nice examples of Doug Tallamy books on the table over here. If you've never read Doug's books. Uh, one of the quotes from Doug's research, and when I say Doug, I just want you to know there's a whole research team with him. It's tough. It's tough to be Doug. He gets a lot of attention. But there's a lot of people underneath him that are doing this research with him. So it's not just Doug, it's Doug's team. I like to think of it that way. Um, but their research showed that one chickadee nest, can you guys picture a chickadee? I don't know why I didn't put a chickadee on this slide. <laughs> it's a black, black and white capped bird, little bird. I love them. They make like a chickadee dee dee noise. <laughs> I love it. Um, and they seem to be kind of coming in and, out, in and out all year. I love them. So a chickadee nest, just a few eggs, requires six to 9,000 caterpillars to go from an egg to an adult bird, all those babies. That's a lot of caterpillars. And what do caterpillars need? So at that point, you're like, if I want birds, I need caterpillars. And so then you're thinking, how do I provide caterpillars? I can't just go buy caterpillars. KU brought caterpillars, right, <laughs> for the library. Thank you, KU. But those aren't for feeding birds. Um, so what you're planting for a bird would be what's called a host plant. Does anybody know what a host plant is? What do you think? It's a host plant like something that it is a host and makes it into a plant by its like basically kind of like almost like a Oh, interesting. I think what you're getting at is the right answer. And, and it's that it's a plant that provides sort of the resources that a caterpillar needs. So it's like they're almost like a parasite, but it's a little bit different. I think I get what you're getting at. Yeah. So, so for example, monarchs, what do monarchs eat? Monarch caterpillars. Milkweed. milkweed. Absolutely. I love this. Album. Milkweed and only milkweed. Monarch caterpillars can only eat milkweed. So if I wanted to provide monarch, this is so 
twisted, if I wanted to provide monarch caterpillars as food for my chickadee nest, I would plant milkweed and the birds would take the caterpillars every time they hatch. And it happens, folks, it happens. Um, but all caterpillars have specific foods that they eat. Sometimes they eat lots of different things, but they still have a specific group of things that they eat. What about swallowtail caterpillars? Does anybody know? Hmm? Fennel. Fennel. Fennel, fennel, rue. Absolutely. These are very knowledgeable folks. Fennel, rue, dill, almost anything in the parsley family. And the native plants that they use are part of that same family. So uh, golden alexander is uh, part of the parsley family. Um, and I plant a lot of that. I didn't bring any today. I should have. Um, but then also, what else do birds eat? So bird babies eat caterpillars and other bugs. What do other birds eat? What's that yellow bird in the bottom right there? Do we know what that is? It's a coneflower and a goldfinch sitting on a coneflower because they love coneflower seeds. They also like sunflower seeds. Um, so plants that provide seeds that are nutritious for birds. Not all plants provide bird seeds. So this amazing plant that I'm gonna pass around for smelling here in a minute, bee balm, makes itty bitty tiny mint seeds that nobody eats. Um, and that's fine. Um, but a lot of plants produce seeds that are delicious. So this plant here, for our audience at home, I'll try to be a little help, more helpful. Does anybody know what this is? I know Wayne probably knows. Yes, he does. I know Ryan knows. So this has lots of pink flowers on it. It was in some of my slides earlier. Um, this is blazing star. And there's a lot of different blazing stars in Kansas. It's also called gay feather. Um, they make really big seeds that birds love. Um, so when I'm planting for birds and I want a fall blooming species, I might plant blazing star, this particular species of blazing star, which is rough blazing star. So what if I was planting for pollinators, which we just talked about, that's bees, beetles, um, and the like. That's so sad, I can't list any other pollinators. There's a lot. Um, so host plants for caterpillars, because we're trying to support caterpillars, which make butterflies and moths and um, other flying um, things like, like the beetles, have kind of grubs and larvae. Nectar plants, and having something blooming all the time. And here's the, the real big change from traditional gardening, trying not to till anything up, trying not to pull all the weeds all the time, trying not to clean your garden up all the time because your pollinators are living inside of the dead stems of your plants. They're living in your leaves. They're living in the soil. Uh, we have about 500 species of bees native to Kansas and 90, 8% of those bees are solitary bees. That means they're not protecting a nest. They don't have a hive. They have no interest in you. They don't care if you're there. You can pet them. We pet them all the time. It's weird, I know, but you can. They don't care about you. They're all about eating, making babies, and that's it. And they live by themselves. So the girl bee and the boy bee live in different holes in the ground. Um, or they live in stems. But 70% of our native bees, those 500 species, live in the ground. That's a lot of bees in the ground. The other 30% live in dead stems. So when we clean up our gardens really good in fall and winter, because we're being good gardeners, we're throwing all that in the compost and it just, unfortunately, it's the demise of all of those bees and, and other organisms living in your stems and leaves. And there's some amazing moths and, and butterflies that live in your leaf litter too. Um, so leaving your garden a little bit messier, not for forever, but from winter until late spring, leaving that stuff there, leaving, always leaving something is good. Um, and then just trying not to disturb your soil too much. I'm, I, I really struggle with this. I often catch myself digging, trying to clean things up and I have to stop myself. And that's 15 years into native gardening. So it takes a while to relearn. This is what a single bee living in the ground might look like. So she may lay eggs in a few different branches off of her burrow but it's just her living in there. And the guy's somewhere else. He doesn't lay any eggs. He's just, what do they do? I don't know. They just sit around. Um, so <laughs> I'm just being just um, So when I'm planting specifically for pollinators, I'm trying to provide something blooming all the time. And I mean, all the time. As soon as it's possible for a flower to bloom, I want it in my garden. And as late as I can have a flower blooming, and I, I mean, I've had flowers blooming in December, 
um, I want that too. Because the pollinators, as long as there's resources, they're looking for them. Um, so the earliest spring wildflowers are things like, I know you guys know redbuds, those pink trees that bloom so early in the year. That's some of the earliest food for our native bees. Thank you. Um, pussy toes, I love them. They carpet the very lowest places in the, prairie, in the prairie. They're really, really short and silver foliage. And they provide the food. They're the host plant for the American painted lady butterfly. They're so beautiful. If you want more painted ladies, you have to plant pussy toes. And these next few slides are just some really nice images of things that bloom in different seasons. Um, so wild blue indigo, love it. Not, not, not used enough. Yeah, these are just rose verbena. This is in the garden outside. If you have a chance, just get down on your hands and knees and smell the rose verbena. It smells amazing. Contrary to the rose verbena, uh, foxglove beard tongue, which is not a foxglove, if you're concerned about toxic plants, it just looks like a foxglove, so they call it that. That's, called, that's penstemon. A lot of people know penstemon. Husker red penstemon is very common to put in, in, in gardens. That's our native penstemon. There's a few different species and they smell not so great. Um, not when they're blooming, they smell fine when they're blooming, but when they dry out, they smell like feet, in my opinion. One of the coolest experiences that I've ever had is going to the KU herbarium. You should go. What's an herbarium? What do you think an herbarium would do? Herb, what's an herb? It's okay, you can't have a wrong answer. I'll just have fun. What do you think? Yeah. What's an herb? Yeah, mint is a type of herb, yeah. So herb, when you're a botanist, herb means um, a type of plant that's green, not woody. So um, mints, rosemary certainly, but penstemon, ro rose verbena, these are all herbaceous plants, herbs. And so an herbarium is a collection of herbaceous plants and a lot of other things too, but that's where the word derives from. Um, if you go to the KU herbarium, which I recommend everyone do, no matter your age, no matter your interests, they have cabinets of, of specimens that they've flattened. And you can look at all these amazing old collections of prairie plants from hundreds, you know, when, we, when settlers first came. Um, even people's private collections, people who have prairies and just saved flowers because they cared about their prairies and they donate them to the herbarium. It's really cool. But if you open the cabinet where the penstemon is, it smells terrible. And they like to open it for visitors and it just waves over you. It doesn't matter how old the plants are. It's just like, ugh, like you walked into a locker room or something. It's terrible. But they're such an amazing plant. And have you guys, um, you use the internet in some way. So certainly you've seen the bee butt photos. I love the bee butt photos. All the pictures people share of, of bees getting deep into a, a, a tube shaped flower. These are perfect bee butt plants. That's why I like to have them. Summer, milkweeds, really big season for milkweeds. Absolutely. And the cone flowers, the sunflowers start. This is our native Cleome type plant. They actually smell the same. They're part of the same um, family. Um, that's called clammy weed. I love clammy weed. Um, this plant here in the bottom corner, I have a couple in the tray that maybe Jennifer will raffle. Those are called partridge pea. They make really important seeds for ground nesting birds like quail. Um, and then fall, that's where we are now. If you drive past any prairies or if, gosh, if you just drive around Kansas at all, you can see all this gold everywhere. The sunflowers, the golden rods, um, the false sunflowers. Black-eyed Susans, the partridge peas. There's an awful lot of gold. And then the, the blues and the purples come in too. Um, lots of pictures of pollinators and butterflies in my prairie images because you just can't get away from them when you're out there. They're so excited to find prairie. And then the season that everybody forgets, which is maybe the most important season if you're providing for wildlife, which is winter. Um, if you're not allowed to touch it, which is what I just asked you to do, you want it to look okay. You want it to look kind of interesting, right? Um, so leaf textures, some of the grasses. Grass is so important to overwintering birds because they get down in there and they use it as shelter. So do mice and other animals. I mean, just, it's part of it. But birds really need the tall grass. Some of the earliest blooming or the latest, depending on how you think about it, like witch hazel blooms in the middle of the winter. Um, there's some really cool textures. Cactuses are native cactuses. I brought one to show you. And then finally, we were just talking about what would you need if you were living 
in this ecosystem, water, something to drink. And if there's nuance to it, not just a bucket of water, um, unfortunately birds and, and bees will drown if you don't give them a really shallow or easily accessible from a rock uh, uh, water feature. I just, I, I really do. I either get a craggy rock that has a natural depression in it. So rainwater sits in it or when I'm watering, water sits in it, or you could just, you know, one of these automatic pet bowls with some rocks in it. Something easy, it doesn't have to be fancy like that. You should see Wayne's water feature. I can never do it. He's got this amazing garden. And I just, I don't do it, um, but he's amazing. These are all native plants. So that if you were a bee, you could come and work on the prairie clover or these prairie cone flowers and then stop for a sip and you've got everything you need. It's pretty great. Um, when you utilize native plants that are appropriate to your ecosystem, all of a sudden you're not fertilizing, you're not spraying herbicides and pesticides because you're trying to have um, these bees in there um, and, and you're not watering. I only water my new native plantings and only for a few weeks and then I won't touch them anymore. Um, and we're doing this in contrast to the tradition, which right now is, and we're trying to break that tradition. That's part of why you're here. Um, watering lawns, you know, planting plants that don't do well in Kansas because of the droughts and the floods that we're experiencing. It's really tough to be a plant here if you don't belong here. Um, this is what's happening in this country. I mean, to, to preserve the lawn culture, people are spray painting their lawns green. Can you believe that? This is not abnormal. It's sad, but it's true. Um, or putting in plastic lawns. Do you rather have an AstroTurf lawn or, or a little prairie? Um, uh, and we do this with, with all age groups, all interest groups. You certainly can decide how much you wanna invest in this kind of gardening. But if these sorts of changes are appealing to you, and they are to me, um, then, then consider native gardening um, and, and get a little lazy with it. Certainly you could spend a lot of time in your native gardens, I do. Um, but I spend more time taking pictures and collecting seeds and sharing plants than I do weeding and watering and fertilizing, for sure. Um, so these are just some of the ecological perspectives. I'm going to go through them really quick because we already kind of talked about them. You can get real sciency about soil testing. You don't need to. If you're living where there used to be a prairie, you can plant prairie stuff there. If you're living where it used to be a wetland, you'll know because it's clay, water stands in your yard, use wetland plants. If you're living under trees, use for Kansas forest species. Um, you can certainly do this work, but the native plants are not as persnickety as a lot of the plants that we plant that aren't native. Whoa, what did I do? The wrong way. The artistry of native gardening, and then I'm gonna stop harping about native gardening. This plant is blooming in our yard right now, and I love this plant. Does anybody know what this is? Native Kansas plant, hummingbird favorite. Very close, salvia is a really great hummingbird plant too. And we have several native salvias. This is cardinal flower. It's a lobelia. I brought a different lobelia with me today. I have a couple. Maybe you'll win the raffle for them. I know they look scraggly. It's tough to be in a little pot. This is blue lobelia. You could do a sea of blue lobelia much like this. You can see some of the blue lobelia here in the front. So it looks really pitiful in its pot. But these are really great for any of the long tongued bees, just like you'd imagine they are. They have these really long tongues that reach deep into flowers. Um, butterflies with those long proboscis straw on their face or hummingbirds. Hummingbirds love blue lobelia. So we get to, we love hummingbirds. So we plant these tube shaped flowers around our house so we can see them all the time. Um, and then there's these, this zero escaping look. Some people really like that. It's really modern, which I love actually. You can be both cool and doing the right thing um, for the environment. Um, we don't have very many cactus species though, um, but you can certainly use our native short grasses to do a, a no mow lawn. You could burn your lawn, we do that. But what if you were into one of these other styles of gardening? And when I looked up styles of gardening, there are over 120 different types of gardening styles, which just blows my mind. Um, I could name like four, <laughs> um, but you know, French gardening, English gardening. I really like Japanese gardening. Um, so say I really liked Japanese gardening. It would be nice if I would stop doing that. There we go. So say I really liked Japanese gardening. I just found this on the internet somewhere. It's probably like lilacs and uh, azaleas and a bunch of other things we don't have in Kansas, but I want that look. So I went looking for native plants that emulate that look and you can do it. You don't have to have Japanese plants to have a Japanese garden. So that red bud in my early spring, I could use that for my pinks. Um, leatherwood, which is really cool. 
uh, Johnson County has their own species of leatherwood that's only found in Johnson County. Did you know that? Um, and you can buy it and put it in your yard. Um, it's really cool. It's chartreuse and it's called leatherwood because the bark feels like leather and it's strong like leather. It's really cool. You could do these really low spaces. They mow that, I guarantee it. But if you used native sedges and oxalis wood sorrels, you would never have to mow it. You could just enjoy your Japanese garden <laughs> and not, not try to take care of it. To get that azalea happy here, you'd be watering and fertilizing every day. It'd be terrible. Um, so native plants have sort of a bad reputation sometimes, and that's just from lack of experience. Um, a lot of mistakes are made by people who don't know how to do native gardening. Um, not a judgment, I'm here to teach, and I love to talk about native plants. But um, native plants are harder to find, not anymore. They used to be. When I started doing this work, it used to be quite hard to find native plants. You had to go to special sales um, or find your local nursery that only sold a few different species. Um, now, in Tonganoxie, there's one solely native plant, sale, native plant selling nursery, Happy Apples Farm, botanical belongings now. Um, so you could go, if you live in this area, you could go get plants anytime. Um, uh, she only sells native cans of plants. In fact, she only sells plants really that she grows from seeds from her area. And we donate seeds to her every year. Native plants are more expensive. I hear this all the time. I pay $4 across the board for any of my herbaceous native plants that I buy. Um, that's not true if I go to Home Depot and buy random whatever plants. They're not $4. And uh, my native plants come back every year some of them for decades. Um, and if they don't come back for decades, they dump so many seeds that I get lots of new plants every year. Um, native plants are aggressive. That's sometimes true. You should know the properties of your native plant before you plant it. Sometimes it's desirable. I love columbine. Maybe I want a sea of columbine and it's okay for it to shoot seeds everywhere. Um, some native plants are not aggressive at all and you wish they were um, <laughs> because like the blue lobelia, that doesn't spread very fast. Um, so knowing the properties of your plants, do a little bit of research before you go shopping and have a wish list. That's, that's one of the things Americans, and I'm no different, are really bad at is impulse shopping. Going into the box store and buying whatever plant looks good and not knowing where you're going to put it. It's so funny. It's like memes all over the internet. Um, if you, when you do native plant shopping, you can do that. If you go to a native plant nursery like Happy Apples, you can buy whatever you want. But if you don't live in a forest and you bought a forest plant, you're going to be in the same situation. So shopping uh, with intention. And then this is, this is why people don't like native gardening. I can tell you with all the experience I carry with me that you should never plant Canada goldenrod in your garden unless you have a really, really big garden. Do not plant the species in your garden. Don't plant prairie dock in your garden. There's some species that are not garden plants. That's true of all the plants in all the world. Some of them don't belong in a garden. Um, but tall grass prairie plants, Sometimes they look like they'd be really well behaved when you're in a prairie, um, but when you get them home, they do that. And then they fall over and hit your car or block your sidewalk um, or cause you trouble and, uh, or your neighbor gets mad, which is usually the typical situation. Knowing what you're buying, right plant, right place um, is the way to go and ask for help. There's a lot, because the native plants are becoming so much more available, there's so many resources. Um, for researching plants before you buy them. There's even free garden layouts on a lot of websites that you can, so Deep Roots Kansas City um, has a lot of Kansas City area specific garden layouts. This one's from uh, Prairie Moon Nursery. You'd find their website scanning the QRC code on the seed packets back there. Um, Missouri Department of Conservation has a ton of native plant education resources for free on their website. This book, I don't know if the library carries, but I would recommend um, borrowing this from a local library or from a friend or maybe um, donating a copy to the library so it's available. Alan Branhagen used to um, design and care for all of the native gardens and beyond that at Powell Gardens. And uh, he wrote this book from his experiences, absolutely fantastic book. And it's built the way that I would teach people to garden by ecosystem. So he teaches you plants to use based on, on the ecosystem available to you. And the Audubon website now has plants for birds. If you like gardening for birds, they'll tell you what birds are, what plants, what birds are good, what plants are good for specific birds to plant in your garden. Uh, the sky's really the limit. 
Um, here's a, a list of people just in Northeastern Kansas that can help you for free with this kind of question. Um, there's certainly um, companies, contractors that can help you too. And we, we are transitioning from doing that to being a nonprofit only. Um, but these people will all help you for free. Just reach out and ask them questions. They have online pages and, and groups, or you can email them, or you can just go bug them in person. You have your own master gardener group, I know, because I was, I was in the garden and I know that they know about native plants. So I, I challenge you all, if you haven't done it already, and if you have, try a new species this year. But if you haven't already, choose a species and add it to your garden. And here are some really nice examples of places you can go pick up native plants and you don't have to read all the labels, right? You can go straight in, they only sell native plants. Um, there's two in Kansas City coming up. I love these because they bring in native plant nurseries from all over the region. So there's like five or six different native plant nurseries that sell in the same place. And then this is Grassland Heritage Foundation's two fall sales. I know they're really tiny, September 10th and September 15th. I will leave this slide up when I'm done. Just know, um, you've probably seen a lot of native plant gardening discussion. This is um, not going away. <laughs> this is, we, for 150 years, we forgot, but now we're back to realizing native plants are really, really, really important and they're absolutely gorgeous. So um, now's the time to start learning about it and, and demonstrating in your own yard what we should all be doing. Um, and that's all, and I wanna to talk to all of you after. So thank you so much for being here. Um, and again, I'm Courtney, but call me Hey You if you wanna talk. <laughs> I'll put this back on when the plant sales are. Thank you all so much. Thank you. I don't see any questions in the chat on Zoom. If you're on Zoom and listening, feel free to put some questions in there. If you're in person, Jennifer is going to raffle native plants and I can talk to you about where they grow if you win one. Everybody can have a native plant. Exactly. Oh, I love it. That was not intentional, but I love it. Um, I'm gonna half keep my eyes on the chat, but anybody have questions? I know I, I talk a lot, so I probably answered a lot of them. I have two. Yes. Um, what about like, um, very like, into okay, so that's yeah, two different but very important questions. So the first one was let's talk about the dust bowl, and the second one was about um, herbicide or pest, you know, herbicide or pesticide application by planes. So the first one, the Great Dust Bowl, absolutely uh, driven by the loss of prairie and unsustainable. Uh, food, agricultural, land management. Um, we've learned a lot from that situation. We still have a long way to go. Um, but when you till up that much space and leave it in a drought, like what we experienced this year, a lot of crops die and then you just have bare soil. Whereas uh, if you happen to be lucky enough to live near a grassland, the grassland did not care about that drought at all. The prairies got a little wilty on the very hottest days, but that's it. They stayed green, they anchored the soil. The, on the windiest day, you couldn't tell in a prairie, it was gorgeous. Um, so Great Dust Bowl absolutely would have been one of the symptoms of prairie loss. Um, and as far as application of chemicals from plains, that is really tough on, on wildlife. Um, we know that. It's much more minimally used than it used to be, but it's still used. Um, but it's something that we have to think about as conservationists is, is it really a necessary tool um, is there a different way to apply those chemicals that's safer? Um, did I answer your question? Yes. Okay. Um, is there a way to like, uh, Good question. Yeah. So the question for those of you online, if you wanted to support this type of work, we have a volunteer sign-up sheet on the table over there, and we don't bug you. I very rarely, in fact, I'm bad about emailing, <laughs> but. Um, um, we will be doing more working with volunteers as we convert to a nonprofit, and we'd love to reach out to you. We do everything from planting native gardens to in, managing invasive species to um, doing education in the community and um, anytime you can show up. And sometimes that just means you come and take pictures and that's really helpful for me. Or you help me spread the word about a project. That's really helpful for me. It doesn't always mean you have to come sweat, but we love when people come sweat. It's good for you. <laughs>
Good question. Any other questions? Anybody who hasn't had a chance to ask? And I'm gonna stand around if you're not a, asking questions in a group of people person, cause I'm not either. It's okay. I would love to, that's a great idea. So Jennifer, our kindly wonderful library helper asked if I would talk about these plants. I'm gonna try so hard not to get dirt all over the floor. I will help clean it up. Um, so we talked about, coming back in the video, uh, blazing star. This is specifically rough or button blazing star. It's a fall blooming blazing star. So this one's short because it's in a pot, but it gets about this tall and has purple flowers all up and down the stem. It's gorgeous. Um, it doesn't smell like much or I'd pass that one around, but I'm going to pass some other things around. Wayne, what's this one? That's a bee balm. Um, I recommend, and the person who wins the bee balm as their choice um, or chooses the bee balm, don't worry, rub the leaves a little bit, it will recover. Yeah, it's a very nice smelling plant and the whole plant is a mint. Um, so you can, anybody who's familiar with mints know you can make fantastic tea. And I actually use bee balm as insect repellent. When I'm outside and I'm getting super bothered by mosquitoes, I tear some of the leaves off, rub them on my arms, keeps the bugs off of you and you smell amazing to boot. Um, what's this? It's a type of goldenrod, yeah. This one's specific. This one's elm leaf goldenrod, which is actually my favorite, well, my favorite woodland goldenrod. So if you have shade, you don't have prairie, your ecosystem isn't prairie. I have a couple of shade plants over here. I didn't wanna exclude anybody. So you let me know if you need a shade plant. Otherwise, if you've got sun, I've got sun plants. Um, we talked about blue lobelia, beautiful. Needs a little bit more moisture than prairie plants. This is not a prairie plant. It's an, a wetland edge plant. Um, ooh, this is a good one to scratch and sniff. Anybody recognize this ferny, beautiful foliage? It's a typical garden plant, but this one's special. You'll know when you smell it. Mm. Ryan, you wanna start that one around? That's yarrow. It's our native yarrow. It's a white yarrow. A lot of folks plant yellow and red yarrow. They're fine for general pollinators. For our native pollinators um, that are a little more specific, you wanna rub the leaves of that yarrow. It smells so good. Um, you wanna plant the white yarrow, our native yarrow, because it's the one they recognize. The yellow and the reds come from different parts of the world. Ooh, here's another one gardeners might recognize. The leaves are hydrophobic. If you wanna break it down in your vocab, hydro, what's hydro mean? Water, what's phobic mean? A phobia, fear. So that means that it's repelling water. You, I bet you can think of plants in a garden that have water that bead on the leaves and it's really cool and it runs off. Like hostas do this, bleeding hearts do this, columbine does that. This is our native columbine. It's that red columbine with the yellow center. That picture's a little unfair. That's an old, old columbine population that's really spread, but it does shoot seeds off. So, but they're so easy to pull. These are not deep-rooted prey plants. This is a woodland edge uh, plant. It can do full sun if, it, if you're gonna water. Um, otherwise it gets a little wilty. Um, and then I promised to share our native cactus. This is, <laughs> this is not what our cactus looks like when it's a grown up. These are babies. Um, prickly pear, who knows prickly pear cactuses? And if you've, have you tasted prickly pear drinks or prickly pear desserts? It seems like people are using prickly pear in everything now. Prickly pear, the whole plant is edible except for the spines. Um, the way to get the spines off is to burn them in a fire or scrape them off with a knife. Um, the, the indigenous folks of the southern portion of the country and Mexico, and certainly here historically, especially the western part of the state, would have eaten the paddles, which is the broad, flat part of a cactus, um, kind of steamed it or cooked it or cooked it over the fire, and it tastes like green beans to me. It's nopales. Um, nopales is a really important um, food in, in Mexican culture, South American culture, and certainly in the indigenous cultures uh, of, of, of the North American region. Um, these spread slowly. If you eat them, they're not gonna be a problem. If you never eat your prickly pears or cut them back and share them with friends, eventually they take over a little bit more space every year. These are really great if you have, a re we plant these on the south side of our house where it's so hot that the siding is melting on the side of our house. Prickly pear doesn't care. It has gorgeous flowers, giant yellow flowers. 
um, kind of like a, a double bloom poppy kind of look like lots of big delicate pastel yellow flowers and then it makes this big pink fruit and the pink fruit to me tastes kind of like watermelon it's very unique flavor um, every part of the cactus is delicious though not very fast they won't spread um, far unless animals are taking the fruit and moving them around and you might get it takes so long this is a year and a half old <laughs> um, but when they start making their hand their big paddles um, the paddles will fall over and root so it just kind of crawls slowly we eat it fast enough that it does it stays in one small area um, good question though. and one more smell this is another bee balm this is called Spot, I'm sorry about the dirt, Jennifer. This is called spotted bee balm, and it's cool because it has stacks of flowers, kind of like a pagoda, if you like Japanese culture, has these stacks of blooms. Um, and it's called spotted bee balm. When, when you get this plant in your hand, look at the flowers. They have spots all over them. They're really cool. Thank you, Jennifer. And crush the leaves and smell it. It smells a little different than the other bee balm. Good question. Both of those bee balms can do really dry and really hot. The first bee balm can handle more moisture and more shade though. So if you're sun limited, you wouldn't choose that bee balm, the spotted bee balm. That's more of a or true prairie, really hot, dry bee balm. The other bee balm can do forest edge or wetland edge, but it can also do quite dry. It's a lot taller though. That one only gets two feet tall. Mm -hmm. Good question, Wayne. Um, okay, so that's, I think that's all of our, uh, well, I guess I have one more friend I didn't teach you. And that's gray-headed coneflower. Hmm? Oh, I didn't, well, I talked about partridge pea before and I forgot. It's sleeping. This looks so sad, but partridge peas, a lot of legumes close up at night and it knows that I'm inside. There's no sunshine here. So it closed up. Don't be sad about the partridge peas. The people who get partridge peas, they are annuals. So what you're really getting when you get this from me are these seed pods. That's what you really care about. You wanna get this in the ground, the seed pods will turn brown and kind of shoot seeds off. So it's a wonderful addition to your a sort of more naturalized space. They're really easy to move if they pop up somewhere you don't want them to. And it's not like you get a thousand, you get a couple here and there, but the flowers are amazing. They have big yellow flowers that bees just love. Um, and then the last one is gray headed coneflower, which is um, a fairly tall coneflower. It's one of my favorite plants um, because the seed smells so good. That's so weird. Um, if you're not a seed smeller, you should smell the seeds back there. There's gray headed coneflower seeds in the seed blend. Um, so it's a babe, but it will get this big, lives for a really, really long time. And the coneflowers, it's not a coneflower like an echinacea that has the spiky seeds that the um, goldfinches eat. It actually has, it's like a solid ball of seeds. So all kinds of birds will use it. Um, and I, when they did research on bees in Kansas City in the prairies to see what were the most valuable prairie plants to bees, this is the number one most valuable bee plant used by more bee species than any other species they observed. So I like to plant this in my bee gardens. Um, you're gonna win no matter which plant you get, but I don't want you to go home with a plant you can't use. So let's make sure we, um, if you have any questions, you just ask, okay? And I'm here to help. Cool. Yeah, do smell them. You can't really beat up a native plant too much, especially at this age. So use your native plants. Awesome. I'm gonna turn my mic off now. I think we're gonna go into our exploring native plants together phase. Um, if you have any questions, I'll leave the chat open and I'll type in the response. Thank you everyone online. I really appreciate you being here.